Hello everyone. Welcome to another program of Study the Word. Each week this is brought to you by the River Ridge Church of Christ that meets at 5600 Van Road in Newburgh. That's two miles east of Castle High School, uh, just off of 261. Folks, if you're ever in the area, we'd love to have you come and assemble with us. You'd be our honored guest. You're going to notice um, our website at the bottom of the screen, and reason being, you can go there and check out many of the free Bible study helps that we offer, but we remind our viewers every week that if you can't get out and worship with us, you can watch our services live streamed over our website. So you can go there, click on the icon of watching our services, and uh, you can get an idea of what we teach and what we preach and uh, before you even come and assemble with us. So please keep that in mind. And uh, that phone number, please keep it handy. You have Bible questions? You deserve Bible answers. And uh, we've been inundated with all kinds of questions of late. And that's pleased us uh, so much. And we want to help you become more familiar with God's Word. So please take advantage of that offer to call in your questions or to partake of any of the free Bible study offers that you'll notice at the bottom of your screen as we study today. So we hope you'll stay tuned for the next half hour as we open up our scriptures and deal with this week's Bible question, which is, are there signs today that we should be looking for? You know, recently this question was asked to me and I preached on it and uh, because it was a really good question and, and the members needed to understand the answer also, as we all do. And some people seem to think that God will speak to us today through signs to confirm if the choices we are going to make or whether uh, we are approved in His sight, He's letting us know. I'll tell you folks, there's a lot of religious confusion today. There's also a lot of people that are fed up with religion because of inconsistencies. This is one of those subjects that the average person will hear a religious person say something that while well, God gave them a sign and they'll just roll their eyes. And guess what? I'm on their side. I would roll my eyes too. Because that's just not biblical. What? Did God, did, did God ever give signs? Of course He gave signs. He gave non-miraculous signs and He gave some miraculous signs in biblical times. But as far as today, God giving us a sign, which some people would say, you know, I'm going to I'm going to marry this person or I want to take this job offer. God, if you'll just give me a sign and then I'll know that I'll have your approval on that. Does that really exist? Well, let's go to the Word of God and let's point out a few things to show you, first of all, that signs did exist. First of all, non-miraculous signs did exist. I'm going to be reading from a passage back in the Old Testament in the book of Numbers. Numbers and Numbers chapter 16, beginning at verse 36. And I will remind you with all the, the verses that we're going to cover, if you would like a free copy of this on DVD, please request it. All right, here we are, Numbers 16, and I'm going to begin reading in verse 36 where it says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Tell Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, to pick up the censers out of the blaze, for they are holy and scatter the fire some distance away. The censers of these men who sinned against their own souls, let them be made into hammered plates as a covering for the altar, because they presented them before the Lord. Therefore they are holy, and they shall be assigned to the children of Israel. So Eleazar the priest took the bronze censers which those who were burned up had presented, and they were hammered out as a covering on the altar, and they were used as a memorial. So. Was it a sign? Well, yeah, it was a sign, but they took it by their own hands and, and made it that way. Um, for example, you can go to uh, Joshua chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. You know, you, we find that people were supposed to pick up stones as a representation of when they crossed the waters on dry land, uh, the waters parted, and they were to put up as a memorial. And if you read that text there in Joshua chapter 4, you'll notice that those stones were there because if their children were to ask, 
they would say, well, this is a sign of what God did. Well, what do you mean, what kind of sign? Was it a miraculous? It wasn't a miraculous sign. They made that altar of stones with their own hands. But it said it was a sign. Uh, the miraculous signs. Well, you can go to Genesis chapter 9 and read about the flood and how that God put a rainbow in the sky. And, of course, that was a sign of the covenant between God and man that he would never cause the world to flood again. You can go to Isaiah chapter 7, verses 10 through 14. There was going to be a sign that, a, that a, the Messiah would be born of a virgin. Yeah, that would be a sign. That's not man-made. Something man-made would be a man with a woman, not a virgin giving birth to a child. So that was a miraculous sign. The point is, signs were used to confirm things. I understand that. That's why people would look for signs today because they want to make choices and they want God to confirm that. But I'm telling you, people are making signs out of things that just do not exist. I mean, I was telling some people the other day that, uh, you know, it, it's sad when there's going to be a tornado because you know what I, what I dread when there's a tornado? What I dread is that it hits a complex or community of homes and it hits a bunch of homes and then the tornado skips over a home. Well, what do you think the people think who own that home where the tornado skipped over? They're going to say, it's a sign. It's a sign that God approves of us. Well, isn't that sad? Is it a sign that all the other homes that were destroyed, that God doesn't approve of them? It's no wonder people get fed up with religion with that kind of reasoning. It's silly. It's, it's absolutely ridiculous that people would think that way. Because they're trying to justify what they're doing by saying, I saw a sign. Look, over in the New Testament, I'm going to be going to John chapter 20. And we notice that when Jesus was on the earth, he performed many signs and wonders. But why did he do that? Well, the reason why he did that was so that people would listen to him, listen to what he had to say. John chapter 20, it says in verse 30, And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But I'm talking about the ones that he did do it in front of his disciples, which are written. It said in verse 31, But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Those signs and wonders that are recorded in the scriptures are given for us so that we can uh, believe in Jesus and, and who he is. Over in uh, John the fourth chapter, if we just back up a few chapters, same book, John chapter 4, and beginning in verse 46, it says, Jesus came again to Canaan of Galilee where he had made the water into wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. And when he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and implored to him to come down to heal his son, for he was at the point of death. And Jesus said to him, Unless you people see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe. And he went ahead and he healed the son. And the guy found out that his son was healed at the moment Jesus said, Your son will live. And again, it says in verse 54, this again is the second sign Jesus did when he had come out of Judea. So there were signs and wonders that Jesus performed. And not only Jesus, but even, even the apostles uh, in New Testament times, they were required to, to uh, use the spiritual gifts that they possessed uh, to give the signs and wonders to confirm the message that they were pre preaching. Now, for you and I, I don't have to get on this TV program and give you a sign, perform some kind of miracle to confirm what I am teaching you is the truth. I don't have to do that. Why? Well, because you just go to the Word of God and check it out. You know, in Acts 17, 11, they searched the Scriptures daily to see whether those things were so. They didn't wait for a sign. Now remember, those signs and wonders were done in New Testament times when they didn't have the Bible in its complete form. I mean, how would they know who's telling the truth? I mean, if you had the apostles and you had false teachers and people listening to both, they'd say, well, who's telling me the truth? The ones who could confirm it with signs and wonders. Is that biblical? Listen to this. Before Jesus ascended back to heaven, 
in Mark chapter 16, verse 19, it said, So then after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, confirming the word through accompanying signs. They confirmed the word. Now we have the word in its complete form today. Jude 3, it's been delivered. Uh, 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. So saying that, he said, what's it profitable for? Well, for correction, for instruction, to reprove. Why? Because the word of God is complete. I don't need a sign to tell me that what I now believe is right. I just look at the word of God. And, and that's the problem that we have today. We, we have a lot of skeptics today. And some of the biggest skeptics we have are in the religious realm. Religious people can be the biggest skeptics because they're the ones who are saying, you know what, I need a sign before I'm going to believe anything. Well, you have the word today. Now, this is nothing new. This existed in New Testament times. I'm going to go to Matthew, the 12th chapter, and I'm going to begin reading in verse 38. Listen to this. Then some of the scribes and the Pharisees answered, saying, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. He answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. Where it said, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up in judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah and indeed a greater than Jonah is here. You want to see a sign, what he's telling them? Learn from what happened back here with Jonah. And they could sit there and go, well, what are we going to learn from that? Well, Jonah went and preached to the city of Nineveh and they, and they repented. Their actions are judging you. And I go, what do you mean, judging us? Well, because a greater than Jonah is standing before you, and that's Jesus. And you're not repenting, you're not listening. And so, you're sitting there wanting to seek a sign, and you're not even learning from the signs of the Old Testament, the lessons that are there. Again, even when Jesus died, went back to heaven, and the church was established, the early Christians had to face people who were the same way. People that want to want to seek a sign. I'm going to be going over to 1 Corinthians, the first chapter. Let me begin reading in verse 20. Listen to what Paul wrote to these brethren. He said, Where's the wise? Where's the scribe? Where's the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since the wisdom of God... Um, the world through wisdom did not know God. It pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. Now get this, verse 22. For the Jews request a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. Let me tell you folks, if I could perform some kind of miracle and CNN got a hold of me, you know what they would say? They would say, show us a sign. You know what would happen if I, took, if I showed a sign? They'd say, show us another one. After that, show us another one. After that, show us another one. You see, that's the problem that we have today because people have not learned. The purpose of it was to listen to the message, not to be converted to a sign. There are people today, they're not going to believe anything unless they see a sign. The Word of God has become secondary. And I'm trying to tell them that the Word of God trumps everything. It trumps your feelings. Your, it, it trumps an experience that you face. No matter what you go through in life, this Word of God trumps it all. And I'm going to give you a clear example of this over in John, the sixth chapter. Now, Jesus fed 5,000 people miraculously. Go ahead and read it. Now, the next day, those same people came seeking Jesus. Well, I guess I would too. I mean, I've seen a miracle like that. I would want to go and listen to what he had to say. Hopefully, that would be my attitude. But I want you to notice the attitude of these people when they were seeking Jesus. 
So I'm in John chapter 6. This is after they were fed. It's the next day they, came, they come looking for Jesus. And it says in verse 25, And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? And Jesus answered them and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me, not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you because God, has, God the Father has set his seal on him. Did you notice these people saw the sign, but they didn't learn from it. Now you're seeking me, what, to get your bellies filled. You see a free meal here. You, you didn't learn anything. You seek me not for the right reason. And so you have people nowadays who are sitting there saying, you know what, I'm not going to listen to the message. I just want to see signs. And people don't, they're not even content with the plan of salvation, how to become a Christian. Oh, no, they're not content with that because, you know, the Bible teaches us in Jude 3 that there's a common salvation. Well, that doesn't appeal to a lot of people. They don't want a common salvation, hear the word of God, obey the gospel, and become a Christian. They want to do that. They want something miraculous. They want to be. They want a sign. They want to be driving down the road someday. Or somebody told me one day they were in their house and and they heard a voice. Don't. And the person told me that. Well, you know what? I was thinking about getting some more alcohol, and I heard a voice say, "Don't." And it was a sign. He said it was a sign. And like people tell me, they're in they're in a car and they're drunk and they're driving down the road and and. There was, a, there was a sign, this flash, and I knew it was a sign from God, and I wasn't drunk anymore, and I haven't had a drink since. Wow, what a great story. What a bunch of baloney. Best word I can come up with. Why? Because the, the people out there who are really interested in maybe spiritual things, it gets turned off by that because they're logically thinking, okay, where was God when the two-year-old girl got run over by a drunk driver? Or the innocent person in their house that got shot by a drive-by shooting and a stray bullet killed them. You know, people want to use signs for their benefit. And you can create signs out of anything. Seriously, you can create signs out of anything. I used an example the other day that we had one of our members. I noticed his phone number had two sixes in it. And that his name had six letters in it. Six, six, six. Do you know what that meant? Well, that meant he has two sixes in his phone number and he has six letters in his name. That's it. It doesn't mean anything. But people would love to read stuff into that. They want to make a big deal out of numbers. They want to make big deals out of some circumstance. And I'm going to tell you, there are some things that go on in people's lives I might not be able to explain it, but they're going to say, well, it's a sign. What do you mean it's a sign? You know, if some tragedy happens, does that mean that you've been, that you've been bad? You know, the, a passage I use a lot in talking about these sort of things, because it relates to a lot of different subjects, and it directly relates to what we're talking about right here, and that's what Jesus said on the Sermon on the Mount. And folks, you really need to get this point to really understand how foolish it is for people today to say they've seen a sign or God has given them a sign and they therefore know that God is approving of their lives. Here it is. In Matthew chapter 5, in verse 43 beginning, Jesus said, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemy. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. That you may be the sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good. He sends the rain on the just and on the unjust. What's that mean? That means good things can happen to bad people and bad things can happen to good people. An unjust person who's a farmer and has rains and has a su successful crop. 
Well, I guess that means that God approves of him. It's a sign from heaven. No, it's not. No, it's not. As a matter of fact, look at verse 44. That shows the inconsistency. It's no wonder people are getting turned off by religion today because religious people do not handle the word of God properly. And they're just nothing more than false teachers. Remember what I read in verse 44? Jesus said, but I say to you, love your enemies. Wait a minute. If I love you, you're going to bless me and I won't have enemies. No. Bless those who curse you. Well, people curse me. That must be a sign that I'm not living godly. No. Do good to those who hate you. Wow, if people hate me, that's a sign from God. No, it's not. It's a sign that people hate you. And, and he, what he says right here is that those who hate, hate you, um, he wants you to pray for them and for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Now, people think that when, when these bad things happen to me, God's trying to send a message to me. Or if, you know, you're going to buy a house and it falls through, well, you know, that's a sign from God. Look, God works in many different ways. I understand that, His providential care. And, and if you say to me, Chuck, you know, um, I was going to the hospital and, and there was a parking spot right out front and I took my son in and they said if you'd have been, you know, 30 seconds later, he would have lost his leg. How do you explain that? Well, I don't, I can't explain that. Is there anything biblical that you can apply to that incident? I sure can. And it's found over in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. When we talk about all kinds of things happening, <clears throat> you know, the decisions that you're making and you, you know, you're going to get married and, and, and you pray about those sort of things and you want to make the right choices. And then some good things happen to you. How do you explain? What, what are you going to say? Well, here's what you do. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, he tells us in verse 16, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Be thankful. Did God specifically open that up so you had a parking spot to get your son in there, but then somebody else that was coming in with an emergency, you had taken their spot? Does God play, play favorites? Of course not. God's not a respecter of persons. Now that's the problem we have, and that's what's causing the religious confusion and people getting turned off, because you're creating this, this idea that God plays favorites. And God doesn't. He's not a respecter of persons. He's not willing that any should perish, 2 Peter 3 and verse 9. He wants everybody to go to heaven. But he sends the rain on the just and the, on the unjust. So if you get a promotion, you got good health, you recover from a surgery, <clears throat> does that mean that you're godly? No, not, not at all. Does that mean you can't be thankful? Of course you can be thankful. But it's not God putting his seal of approval on you. You need to be aware of that. You know, an interesting passage over in the book of Acts, the 8th chapter. Read about verses 26 on. And you can read about the conversion of the Ethiopian. It says, this man went to Jerusalem to worship. He's returning home. He's reading his Bible. A preacher comes to him and teaches him and converts him. But wait a minute. I thought, wasn't he already faithful to God because he worshipped God and he read his Bible? There's a lot of people who worship God and read their Bible. They're not going to heaven, folks. A lot of religious people are not going to heaven. And one of the reasons for that is their misunderstanding about what we're talking about right now when it comes to um, signs and people wanting to, to look for signs. I'm going to tell you, we need to realize that we've, we have an adversary and he's going to use all kinds of tools. And what you might consider a sign of approval from God might very well be the tool of Satan to draw you away from God. Let's face it. One of the best tools he has is to have you and I think we're okay when we're really not. And he talks about that over here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Let me begin reading in verse 9. He says, The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason God will send them a strong delusion that they might believe a lie. So what's he talking about there? Well, he, he mentions their lack of love for the truth. You can know the word. Jesus said you can know the truth and the truth will set you free, John 8 and 32. So you can't twist things that you see in this world to try to justify doing things contrary to the word of God. 
His followers were told to go into all the world and preach the gospel. It's the message that saves, Romans 1, 16. It's the power of God unto salvation. The power of God unto salvation is not a sign. No, the power of God unto salvation is, is walking by faith, and faith comes by hearing the word of God, Romans 10 and verse 17. It's, it's not a strong feeling. And when somebody tells me that, Chuck, no, no, I think I'm okay, I know I'm okay, because, and this is a true story, somebody told me one time, that, Chuck, I, I had a hard time, I heard the phone ringing, this was back before cell phone days, I couldn't get to the phone, I was frantically trying to get the door open, I finally got the door open, I ran, and it had been ringing a number of times, and I picked it up, and the person on the other end said, I was just about to hang up, and if I would have hung up, you would not have received this adopted child. And so that person said, that was a sign from God. No, that's something you can be thankful for, but that's not a sign of approval from God that you're right with Him and you're going to heaven. The rain falls on the just and on the unjust. There are such things as coincidences, such things as accidents. And people will use a coincidence and an accident or some good fortune to interpret it as a sign from God. And I want you to understand that what you need to do is get into the Word of God and study it because people can twist all kinds of signs. Remember the line wonders? Because people don't really want to believe the Word of God. And if it comes right down to it, they're going to say, well, what I experienced and what the Word of God has to say, they'll say, I choose my experience. That proves it. No. You have to look into the perfect law of liberty. Continue in it, as James 1 describes, and we want to help you in your study of the Scriptures. We offer a free six-lesson home Bible study course we can mail out to you. So if you would like that, just call in, leave your name and your address, and I'll mail it out to you. Nobody's going to show up at your home. Would you like a face-to-face -face Bible study? Been getting those requests. Lady called up and said, can we meet? I said, yes. I'll bring my wife and we'll study. Um, if you would like a face-to-face, -face, your own personal study, we'll get together once a week for about 40, 45 minutes. If you're interested in that, give us a call. How would, would you like to be put on our mailing list for our weekly bulletins, like a short sermon on paper? And uh, we have many, many people in the community receiving that. If you're interested, just leave your name and address, and we'll put you on the list. Please don't forget our weekly live radio program every Sunday afternoon at 2 o'clock, 98.5 FM. And um, I also want to encourage you to... Um, request a free DVD if this topic you think was, is, is of interest to somebody else. Uh, that's something that you can do also. Don't forget you can contact us with Bible questions and Lord willing we'll be back here next time. We're going to open up our Bibles together and we're going to study the Word. This has been brought to you by the River Ridge Church of Christ that meets at 5600 Van Road in Newburgh. Thank you folks for joining us and have yourselves a great day.